For many false prophets have gone out into the world. <clears throat> By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit which confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit which does not confess Jesus is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you heard that it was coming. And now it is in the world already. Little children, you are of God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore what they say is of the world, and the world listens to them. We are of God. Whoever knows God listens to us, and he who is not of God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Heavenly Father, open our minds and hearts this evening as we contemplate sacred truth, as we contemplate great gifts and resources you have given to us, and as we do so under the patronage of St. Thomas Aquinas. We ask all this in the prayer that your Son has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you for coming out this evening, on this, this cold winter January evening, now that winter's finally here. So those of you who are new to Into the Deep, just to explain, this is um, really an opportunity for further uh, reflection on our faith, kind of feeding the mind, feeding the mind so that the heart can love more. This is the idea. You know, I think I'm also in charge of the RCIA program, and people are often um, sort of jealous almost of those who get to go through the RCIA process and learn as an adult the faith in a, in a whole in a comprehensive way. So Into the Deep is especially offered um, for all Catholics as a way to dive deeper into the faith, hence the name, the name Father Boniface came up with. And we have different themes throughout the month, throughout the months. This year in particular, I've been, I've been trying to take almost a, a liturgical theme. So in September, we had the Feast of the Angels. So we had a talk on the angels. In October, we talked about the reform of the church in November, we talked about indulgences and purgatory. In December, we talked about the Blessed Virgin Mary and what she shows us about Christ. And here in January, we will have the Feast of St. Thomas Aquinas at the end of the month. So I think it's especially appropriate to have a talk devoted a little bit more directly to St. Thomas's teaching. You might rightly object and say, well, you Dominicans are always presenting Thomas, even if, you don't, even if you're not honest about it. <laughs> and that's guilty as charged. But this, I think, is helpful because we're looking at a very basic topic, Aquinas on God. Aquinas' philosophical and theological principles about God that help us, well, talk to other people about God. So that's the, the title tonight of the talk, How to Talk to People About God, Tips from Thomas Aquinas. We all have a desire to share what we know and love. Think about it. Whenever you have good news come to you, you can't help but share it with someone else. To call up a friend, share the good news. This is true of our faith as well. The more we take hold of it, the more we want to share it. It's also true that we have a right and an obligation to share the faith. Christ gave the missionary mandate to the church from the beginning, go and teach all nations. So where do we begin? So tonight's talk is not so much a <clears throat> strategy for evangelization, because the way that you talk about God to your family and friends, to strangers you meet, to those you become acquainted with, is highly particular. And you need to, in a way, trust your own human prudence in those situations and the movements of the Holy Spirit. This talk is more about laying a foundation. What are some principles we can take, especially from Aquinas, about how to begin a conversation? And just to leave you with the main point, or to state the main point from the beginning, I think when you actually study some of this, 
it can be a great source of confidence because one of the most significant things St. Thomas does is show us just how much we have in common with, frankly, everyone else. Those whom we don't think share a whole lot in common with us in terms of our religious background, in terms of our practice of the faith. Yet, in fact, we do share a whole lot in common, or at least we have a common human foundation with which to build on. So it's almost not worth mentioning the, the culture we live in and the difficulty about talking about God, about conversation about God. It's hard enough to have a regular conversation, how much more a conversation about a religious subject. <clears throat> Atheism and agnosticism are often perceived as the default option, and us religious people are seen as engaging in an extracurricular activity. And so the other difficulty is that our friendship with God is something personal and intimate, as it truly is, but often people just merely leave it there pretending that religion is a private matter and something you cannot openly discuss, something you might risk offending someone if you bring up the Lord. But we know atheism is not the default option. Agnosticism is not the default option. We're not engaging in anything extracurricular as religious believers. We're in, when we grasp our faith, when we cling to our faith and practice it, we're doing something that actually fulfills our human nature. And what we know and believe, we desire everyone to know and believe. So St. Thomas gives us confidence that we can overcome these present obstacles. God has, in fact, made knowledge of himself available to everyone, both from their natural powers and through supernatural revelation. So that, really, regardless of how intelligent someone is, regardless of what kind of education they had, what kind of religious upbringing they had. When you think about it, the most important things God has to tell us and the things we need to know for our salvation, we can learn in a relatively short amount of time. We can learn, in a way, in a matter of instance. Grace doesn't need time so much as we, as we receive it. So my presentation tonight, that's all a prelude. My presentation tonight is really in two parts. I want to talk about the knowledge of God. How do we know anything about God to begin with? What are our sources? And then in the second part, I'll talk about, well, how do we begin sharing what we know about God? How do we begin talking to others? So the first part, our knowledge of God. So we could begin in a very basic way and ask, how do we know anything about God? How do we know anything about God? And I think a, a good reaction people have, you know, if someone asked you, why do you believe in God? Or how do you know God exists? Someone would say, well, I, I have faith. I believe. This is an unsurprising answer. But it may surprise you to hear that a also true answer, another good answer we could offer, well, I believe God exists because human reason is able to discover him, at least able to discover that he exists and say some basic things about him. I think actually there are many Catholics who are surprised to discover just how committed we are, just how committed the, the church is, just how part and parcel it is with our faith to say this. We can believe, we can rather, I need to qualify my language a little bit, we can come to know that God exists by the use of reason alone. We can come to know that God exists by the use of reason alone. I remember this hitting me for the first time in college when I was at Notre Dame as an undergrad and I had some project where I got to interview a uh, couple of professors and I interviewed Ralph McInerney and this is one of his favorite things, it was one of his favorite things to talk about. Natural theology, knowledge of God through philosophy, and it was uh, a great privilege to have him be the first one to introduce this idea to me. And then I very quickly, just in the course of my studies there, found out, oh, this is not some um, strange truth tucked away in a closet of our tradition. It's actually front and center because it has a whole lot of other consequences. So we can know that God exists even without supernatural faith. It's actually a matter of faith that we don't need faith, strictly speaking, to know that God exists. It was declared at the First Vatican Council, the end of the 1800s. You can um, read that quote that's on the handout there. 
Um, it's uh, very simple, very basic. God, the beginning and end of all things, can be known with certainty from the things that were created through the natural light of human reason. For ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. This is really, that last part is a quote from St. Paul, St. Paul's letter to the Romans. Now, there's all kinds of reasons why it's difficult to discover that God exists, and we, I'll talk a little bit more about those. But I just think it's important that we as Catholics know that, well, this is really a part of our faith, our claim, our bold claim, and just how, you might say, powerful our human reason is, that it's at least possible, it's at least available to us, that we could come to discover God through reflection, through philosophy, through the exercise of our reason. I think, you know, it's, it's also um, good timing that we're now in the week sort of after Epiphany, celebrating Epiphany, because the wise men, the three wise men traveling to the manger, represent in a way the best of human knowledge and its search for God. And yet, even they have a profound openness to grace, openness to the grace that comes from the Christ child. So what I'm saying may sound foreign, but we do have good places in the scriptures that make it clear. For instance, in the Book of Wisdom, there's a beautiful line, a beautiful passage that says, For from the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. From the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. Many of you may know about St. Thomas Aquinas' proofs for God's existence. And he's most known for the five proofs offered in the Summa Theologiae, the Summary of Theology, his great work. He offers five proofs for God's existence. Typically, if someone knows about St. Thomas, or if they've been introduced to him in a class in college, it's with regard to these proofs. But in a way, it's a shame if that's all that we start with, because they're hard to understand on their own. And I question the value of just kind of unleashing them. You know, I think especially on um, 18 to 22 year olds, <laughs> unsuspecting 18 to 22, no, nothing wrong with them. It's just, in particular, at that age, people say, oh, okay, give me the proofs, then I'll know. Um, it's easy, especially at that age, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't blame an age group, I really shouldn't blame an age group, but it's easy enough for us to take on arguments as weapons. <laughs> And the proofs for God's existence are not weapons. Um, they're certainly not that effective in a, in a kind of weaponized way. We don't use them that way. They're meant to take place in the context of deep reflection. Proofs for God's existence aren't the same, the kind of thing you can typically grasp in a single sitting, but they presuppose education in other ways. So, you know, a very intelligent person maybe could really begin to see the force of the proofs after, let's say, a month of study. This is my claim. This is maybe unique to me. But I think to, to do the groundwork right really would take a while. Um, now, it's true that some people have read a Thomas Aquinas' proofs and been struck in a kind of lightning bolt. And that's even led to their conversion very quickly. Um, but we shouldn't take that as the norm. Um, we shouldn't take that as the norm. If you're fans of Monty Python, there's a very funny Monty Python sketch you should look up on YouTube called The World's Funniest Joke. And I think, um, you know, the, the Monty Python writers study philosophy, I think they might have had uh, the proofs for God's existence in mind when they wrote this. But basically, this man sits down and writes a joke. And it turns out that that's the, the funniest joke in the world. It's so funny that when he stopped and read it, it killed him. He died laughing. So then his wife comes in and says, and is distraught. Oh, he's died. What do I do? And she reads the joke, and then she dies laughing. And then the police come in, and you can see where this goes, right? People start dropping like flies as they read the world's funniest joke. <laughs> but then the British government gets a hold of it and weaponize it um, and use it against the Germans in World War II. <laughs> and if you think about it, they, they have to translate it, but they have to translate it. They can only give each person one word to translate. Otherwise, they'll die. Um, one guy translated a phrase and it put him in a coma. You know, so I think it's a great sketch, and it, it shows you 
when people come and say, oh, Aquinas has proofs for God's existence, show them to me, you know, and if I don't get up from my chair and believe in God because of those proofs, well, then they're not effective. This isn't what we should expect from the proofs of God's existence. Um, there's another uh, book, it's a, it's a novel, a French novel called A Corner of the Veil, and it imagines what if proofs, there was a proof for God's existence that had this, like, supernatural effect, that had this uh, lightning bolt effect on everyone. Uh, so it, it teases out the consequences of all of that very funny way. This isn't exactly how it works. Um, you know, people could begin to grasp some bits of the proofs over time to mull on them, but we shouldn't expect them to have a kind of instant reaction on people. That said, um, they are important. They do occupy an important place in our philosophical reflection, our theological reflection. You know, for those who think, well, if it's really a proof, it's going to have an instant effect on me, um, we wouldn't hold mathematical proofs to the same standard. You know, if you went to class and didn't understand the lesson that day and left the classroom not understanding the lesson, it would be kind of a, a moment of pride to decide that the, professor, the teacher was wrong, you know, altogether, or that math is wrong, um, just because you haven't had the time to absorb it. Anyway, that's enough of qualification. I do think that people can grasp the basic sense of the proofs for God's existence. Um, and in a way, the basic sense is already given to us in the scriptures, like in that quote from Romans and from Wisdom. We look at the world, and we understanding it as an effect of God's creation, as an effect of God's action, we can understand something about the God who created the world. Um, so St. Thomas's five ways um, are from act and potency, efficient causality, necessity and contingency, participation and final causality. Those are just the titles. <laughs> um, so you can see what I, I mean by needing to, needing to understand something in the vocabulary as a foundation before expecting the proof to be you know, powerful on you. I do think we can all see what the proofs have in common, though. It's simple. By looking at what God has done, we can learn something about him. We look at the features of the world of our experience and notice things. There's a cause and effect relationship, and we, we search for the ultimate cause. This is along the, the lines of the second way. Or we might notice that, as one first grader, when I went to visit CCD a couple months ago, and you know something's wrong when the teacher says, oh, father's here. Oh, well, so-and-so had a question for you. So could, could you answer it? And I'm thinking, OK, this will be an easy question about church or, or whatever. And the, the first grader says, how could there be nothing? And I'm like, w w could you say that again? Uh, like, is there more to the question? No, no, no. How could there be nothing? God made the world out of nothing. But how could there be nothing? <laughs> Okay. Someone's ready for the third way. Um, <laughs> even in first grade. So I think that just proves the point. If the first grader can, can begin knock on the door of this, uh, albeit at a, at a moment of, of insight, if the first grader can do that, then I think all the rest of us can. One of my classmates in the order is from Louisiana. And uh, we were having some fun one night and, and said, well, okay, how would you explain, you know, like the third way in very, you know, down-to-earth southern terms? And he decided this is the way that it says, well, because there's something that exists, there has to be something that created it. And the things we see can come and go, so there has to be something permanent, something that must exist. So anyway, he begins saying, well, you are, but you could have ain't been. <laughs> And I think that pretty much summarizes it on its own. I added a second premise. I added the second premise, which is there's got to be something that's got to be. And that there's God. So <laughs> you could put these in simple terms because the principle is simple, even if really to do it thoroughly, we need to go through in great detail. I think the other advantage of actually sinking our teeth into Aquinas' proofs is that we begin to see that God is not just someone who set the world in motion, but the one on whom the world depends at every moment here and now. Um, God is not the first domino that sets forth a chain of reactions. God is rather the one holding everything 
in being at every moment. In him we live and move and have our being, St. Paul says, quoting the Greek poetry to the Greeks. In him we live and move and have our being. In other words, if you look at a train car, for instance, regardless of how many train cars there are, the caboose is never going to move if there's not an engine, and if that engine isn't moving right now, you know, where it's a continuous locked-in chain. That's the way we depend on God. Um, the technical word is an essentially subordinated series of causality. That's just, just to say things that, things that depend in the here and now on other things. Um, so we depend on God for every breath, for every action, even to exist. Uh, it's, it's all a gift from God. So that's a little exploration into natural theology. In other words, what we can know about God by reason alone. But I wanted to do that just to show you what it would be like to say we have philosophical knowledge of God. And this is really the main point, that, that God has given us two lights two different kinds of lights, lights by which we can see the truth. And the first is just our human reason. And philosophy is just a practice, when it's, when it's being done authentically, philosophy is just using human reason to inquire into the most fundamental things, the most fundamental truths. The other light that God has given us is the one we're very familiar with, of course, the light of faith, the supernatural light of faith. And this is given to us in Revelation, or it's, it's what allows us to, to take hold of Revelation, Scripture and tradition. Now, if you actually understand what these lights are and the fact that they're both from God, then it's really hard to oppose them. It's very hard to oppose them. If you understand what they are, it's hard to see them as rivals. Because we have this misconception, of course, in our culture, that science and religion are somehow in conflict, that faith and reason are somehow opposed, that in order to be a believer, we need to stop being a thinker. And that's false. In fact, we as Catholics know in order to believe, you need to use your mind. In order to be a believer, you need to be a thinker. That's just the structure of our human nature. God can't give faith to a squirrel. The squirrel doesn't have a spiritual soul with a human mind. So the way to see this is that there are some truths that exceed us and some that are within our grasp. That's the only reason there's like two different lights going on, is because some of the things we can see on our own just through our own human nature, through our human reason, but some have to be given to us. And through the grace of faith, we're elevated in order to see. Our minds are elevated through faith. That's what faith is, the elevation of our minds in grace to see things we couldn't see otherwise. So there's a, a quote there from Aquinas um, from the, one, of, one of his other works. And I like this one because he refers to faith and reason as a twofold mode of truth. Twofold mode of truth. And so this, uh, if we, as soon as we start talking about this, people will ask the question, how far can my human reason go? I've already spent some time saying, well, we can come to know God exists by human reason. People say, okay, what? Well, how far can it go? And St. Thomas, at least a pretty, a pretty uh, simple interpretation of him, a pretty straightforward interpretation of St. Thomas, is, shows that he thinks that human reason on its own can know that God exists that God is one, simple, good, truth, perfect, infinite, incorporeal, intelligent, that he has a will, and that he's all-powerful. At least these things. That's, that's a lot we can know about God. Um, so I have also another, if someone wouldn't mind handing this out, um, I have another handout. Uh, I won't go through it now, but it's, it's a nice thing that you could take home. It's like, according to St. Thomas, what are the limits of faith and reason? Um, this is a chart that shows that. If you can go ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, although St. Thomas thinks we can know a whole lot of things by reason alone, 
he's also very clear that we need faith. We absolutely need faith for two very big reasons. And first of all, that's so that we can know things we could never know without. For instance, so I rattle off that list of truths about God we could know. What are the things that we need faith, absolutely need faith in order to know, in order to see and believe? We need faith to know that God is a trinity of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We need faith to know that the Son of God became man. We need faith to know that Jesus Christ is God and rose from the dead, or that Christ is truly present in the Eucharist. So if you think about it, most of the things in the creed are things we know through faith. Except maybe the very beginning, I believe in one God. The other reason we need faith is because, well, practically speaking, and this might be an answer to a lurking question in your mind, practically speaking, very few people have the leisure to study philosophy in such a way that they'll be able to grasp all these truths about God by reason alone. St. Thomas says that if, if knowledge of God was left up just to our human discovery, just to our natural reason, then only few people would have knowledge of God after a whole long time of searching. And even at that, they would have a lot of errors mixed in with the truths they've discovered. Um, you know, he's just actually very down to earth saying, look, people have family concerns. <laughs> they don't have time to study. Uh, to all be professional philosophers, or to all study philosophy to this great degree. And uh, frankly, some people just aren't inclined to reflection to that degree. So there's a whole bunch of reasons that, that one could list, but we might just put it simply th this way. That God, through his grace, makes up for even the weakness of our natural powers. And so in the the very act of giving us faith makes up for any weakness in our minds, any lack of experience, any, any defect in our, our journey of contemplation, our philosophical reflection. So this is why St. Thomas calls God's revelation a great mercy. He says, beneficially did the divine mercy provide to give us both faith and reason to investigate even those truths, well, you might say we might possibly have gotten to on our own through reason. So he says, in this way, all men would easily be able to have a share in the knowledge of God, in this without uncertainty and error. So I'm now going to go into the more practical side of the talk and, and how, given these things about knowledge of God, how do we begin talking to other people about God? Really, I just want to apply the principles uh, that I've, that I've line, you know, outlined here, saying, well, if this is true and that people can come to know God exists, well, then that should give us a confidence when we begin explaining God to others, that we're not telling them something foreign to their human nature. We're not telling them something they can't get fundamentally. So understanding all of these things changes the way we might approach others. And so, mm -hmm. so tip number one, this is if you flip the, the first handout I gave you, is where the actual tips are, so you don't have to write them down. Um, you, could, you could just read them all right now. Um, but I'll go through these one by one. The first is that <clears throat> when we're talking to other people about God, we want to begin with the common ground we have. And St. Thomas, like I said, helps us realize that even those we don't think we have any common ground with, we do. So I'm not just talking about, you know, interests or, you know, the, the small talk we easily get into. If you think about small talk, it's, it's often spent kind of going back and forth until you find something that you both can talk about or like to talk about. But in a deeper way, we're talking here about what common perspective, perhaps, on God do we have? What common things can we say? Well, if you're arguing with another Catholic about God, there's a great deal in common you have. You have the whole deposit of faith at your disposal, sacred scripture and tradition. 
But if you're talking about God with a non-Catholic Christian, well, think about how you have the whole scriptures at your disposal. You have baptism to talk about, for instance, even if there's different understandings of baptism. If you're talking with someone who, who is Jewish, you at least have the Old Testament to talk to them about. And even if you're talking to someone who is Muslim, you have a, a sense of revelation, a very different sense of revelation, but you still have the unity of God and many other attributes and qualities of God that you can talk about in common. So part of this is obviously that you would want to develop, you would want to take a different strategy depending on who you're talking to. But we might even then say, well, what if someone has absolutely no religious background, and in fact, they're even hostile to religion? Well, there's always at least the common ground of reason, St. Thomas reminds us, so that he says, quote, if your opponent believes nothing of divine revelation, well, there's no longer any means of proving the articles of the faith to them but only answering really their objections. We can at least do that. I think that faith gives us a tremendous confidence. This is probably the most important point. I should have just told you up front. That even when people have objections to the faith, we know that they don't prove their conclusions. Even when people object to the mysteries of the faith. Now, I can't prove to you in the strict sense that Jesus is God. Now, you may have all kinds of objections, but I can take those down. It's going to be a matter of time. I can show that you don't have a foolproof argument against the faith. So if our opponent doesn't agree with Revelation anyway, we can at least answer their objections. This should give us a kind of confidence as believers, you know. And I think also it gives us a humility if we take it the right way. Because you've probably had that experience in talking to people. And you say, I don't know what to say right now but I can find out, you know. I don't know how to answer your question right now, but I know there's an answer out there. Um, and I think, frankly, people, people should be impressed by that. It shows us, well, frankly, our humility as Christians, that we say, yes, I, in, as an individual, don't have all the answers, but I do believe that Jesus Christ is the truth, and he will set you free. The second tip St. Thomas gives us, I think, is to not be afraid to present arguments. Um, you think about it, our, our culture um, avoids arguments more and more. They're, and that's precisely just a strategy of how to win, how to allow falsehood to kind of take over the public sphere. Well, don't bring things to the level of an argument. Keep it at the level of boo and yay, likes and dislikes. That's one way falsehood can win. But we as Catholics, confident in the truth, should be comfortable, you know, actually arguing to a certain extent. Now, um, think of how even the word argument sometimes you need to clarify. People are like, oh, well, we had an argument. You know, that sounds negative automatically. By argument here, I mean just putting some sentences together in a logical way, right? In order to show something, in order to show some truth. This is the way our minds work. This is the way our minds work. So it would be there's been something against our human nature to avoid argument entirely. It's a lesson we can learn from philosophers not to take arguments personally. <laughs> like, so-and-so disagrees with me. And it's like, well, why don't you talk about it? We can argue, for instance, that God exists and that he's one and good and created the world out of nothing and that he guides creation, everything else in that list. And it would be wonderful if everyone could study philosophy, but obviously, for some reasons, we can't make this a serious occupation. Not everyone can make this a serious occupation. But like I said, you can come up with some of the basic sense, you know, that the world is full of effects that we can trace back to the cause who is God. In fact, the world is full of puzzles. That's something to start with, that the world is full of things that don't explain themselves. And to deny that's a problem is to run away from the reality. Like uh, our, that dear fellow Dawkins, who's always saying, well, to, to ask why the universe exists is just a question that doesn't make any sense. He says, no, it's a question that makes perfect sense. <laughs> why does the universe exist? The first grader understands. The first grader is looking for an answer. 
I think, too, it's important, this is the third point, the third tip, to know the limits of our arguments. And that's exactly why, you know, the principles of this chart are helpful, because we realize there are certain things in the faith we simply can't prove. That only when someone has encountered God, only when God's grace has been knocking on their heart, moving them, are they going to be able to see and believe the truths of the faith. But, you know, even before that, or even apart from that, someone can see those basic truths about God, like we said. So we should know the limits of our arguments. We should know, for instance, we shouldn't try to prove the Trinity. <coughs> we shouldn't try to prove that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from the effects in the world. We can, however, say that God exists and see that God exists from the effects in the world. There's... Um, some interesting reasons why that example in particular, um, and St. Thomas kind of has some unique answers there, so I can talk about that more, but I want to go on to number four. We should have a confidence in the truth, confidence in the truth. Remember, we do share a common human nature with everyone who walks this earth, and so the truth is what they're looking for too. The truth is what they're dying to hear and dying from not hearing sometimes. And so I think this is uh, really the, the confidence we should have. It says in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, for instance, that the Church is by her very nature missionary and has been given the mandate by Christ to evangelize, to go out and teach all nations. So the Church has both the obligation but also the right to evangelize. Think about that. We as Catholics have the right to speak the truth to others because at the end of the day, it's what fulfills them too, right? They're not a different species, right? Um, baptism doesn't transform us into a different kind of creature. It supernaturalizes us, makes us children of God, but it doesn't separate us out from non-Christians as belonging to a different species. So everyone is either a child of God or destined to be one. So we should have a confidence in the truth. We can talk to God, we can talk about God to anyone, regardless of the experiences they may have had. And frankly, you know, it's those who have almost no religious background that we talk to and are sometimes the most curious, you know, the most open, the most receptive. We have, in a way, the upper ground of the truth. We can introduce God to people and, you know, and maybe you've had this experience already as you've shared the faith with others. It's almost like we're giving them someone they've been expecting, you know, someone they've been expecting to learn about, someone who fulfills them. The first person I ever helped bring into the church through our CIA, you know, just after baptism and all that set up. This is what I was looking for my whole life, but without knowing exactly where to turn, you know. Um, when the truth takes hold of us, we can have that, that experience. So although we can't prove the mysteries of the faith through arguments, we can defend them. Like I said, we have that kind of blank check from St. Thomas. It says, even if you can't prove the mysteries of the faith, which we can't, um, we, can, we can shoot down the objections. Uh, we can at least take a few steps in that direction. For instance, when someone says, well, how can you believe in the Trinity, you know? that God is three and one. And we say, well, that's actually not what we believe. Uh, we believe that there is one God, three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's not three and one in the same way at the same time. Three and one in a specific way, in the way revealed to us. There are three persons in one divine nature. So there's nothing contradictory there, but there is something that invites us beyond the domain of reason. This is one way to put it, that faith is never against reason, but it does move us above reason. It does call us above reason. Faith is never against reason, but it does call us beyond, call us above. <clears throat> the fifth tip from St. Thomas is that, and I th maybe this is the most important, <laughs> honestly, um, we should realize that someone's objections to belief 
Maybe a substitute for something else. I just leave it very vague there. Might be a substitute for something else. You know, people can feel very threatened by religious belief. Um, I remember being in a doctor's office as a novice. Uh, one of the brothers cut his hand on a candle on accident, so we had to rush him to the doctor's office. And there we were sitting in a habit, like waiting in this minor emergency center, and. Uh, and people started striking up a conversation like, oh, are you priests in training? It's like, yeah, something like that. That's, that's pretty close. He um, says, well, I was, I was Catholic, but then I saw certain things in the church, and then the church didn't help my mother, and you know, so I decided two, two bad things in one religion. I'm not going to be a part of it anymore. And then someone from across the room says, well, you can't, you can't say that, you know, before we even had a chance to respond, before the Dominicans had a chance to respond, woman from across the room goes, well, you can't, you can't critique a religion just because of the actions of a couple of its members, you know, just because you can't say a whole religion's bad. And I'm like, yes, finally, someone, you know, to my rescue. But then that same person goes, but, but I don't believe in any religion. <laughs> um, I, you know, I believe in a personal God and I have a relationship, but I don't need church or organized religion for that. So, you know, people can, you know, everybody's got a different set of hangups, you know, um, someone's reasons for not believing in God um, might be rather strange. Um, it, it might actually be masking a deeper problem. And the person themselves may not even know this. Um, we see also this is really the effect of sin. Um, we should understand this, the rejection of the truth, as an effect of original sin. The fall resulted in ignorance and a weakness in the will. This quote from Humani Generis, which is on the back, is, I think, one worth its weight in gold. And it, you know, is a way to kind of summarize my talk. <clears throat> quote, For though, absolutely speaking, human reason by its own natural force and light can arrive at a true and certain knowledge of the one personal God, still there are not a few obstacles, aka many obstacles, to prevent reason from making fruitful use of its ability. Now the human intellect is hampered by the senses and imagination and evil passions arising from original sin. Hence men, tell me if this doesn't ring true, hence men easily persuade themselves in such matters that what they do not wish to believe is false, or at least doubtful. In other words, if truth appears inconvenient, it's easy to dismiss it because we're sinful human beings, because we experience the fall. If something is going to cause me to change my life in a dramatic way, if something's going to make me uncomfortable and change the way I see the world, well then, maybe it's easier just to deny it. This is what we're up against so often in talking to people about God, that the will under the influence of the lower powers can cloud the mind. It's like looking through a really dirty windshield. You can barely see where you're driving, you know. This is really where a lot of people are at. Not even allowing themselves to receive the truth, to be open to it. And that's why I began with the passage from the first letter to St. John. It says, the world does not listen to us. The world refuses to listen to the truth. For so many people, the problem is not actually with God himself, but with a kind of moral hang-up they have. So many people content themselves with theoretical objections against Christianity, which they use to protect themselves from a deeper consideration of God. In short, for various reasons, we're often inclined to believe whatever is more convenient for us, instead of the truths that will really change and challenge us. If you think about it, beginning to believe in God is a big life-altering step that's going to lead to a whole bunch of other questions. You know, what do I need to do to have a relationship with God? How will he make me change my lifestyle and habits? Will I have to leave some things behind forever? Think of the, the words of the demons that Jesus cast out. I'm not comparing people to demons, but the mentality I am. Think of the words of the demons that Jesus cast out. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Have you come to destroy us? So many people, when they see us as religious people, religious believers, feel threatened. 
feel threatened by the pressure of a truth they haven't grappled with yet. Okay, that's the kind of dark news, but the good news is that if you think about it, it's actually rather important because we don't necessarily need to teach people all of philosophy or carefully build up one argument after another or carefully take down one objection after another. Instead, often we just need to address people's objections to belief and a lot of other things will take care of themselves. You know, uh, there's a principle, I think, in farming. I'm from Kansas, so I should probably know this. That if you mow the pasture, it's got all kinds of weeds. If you mow the pasture down, then the grass will just grow up, and the grass will take over, and then you'll have a nice field of prairie grass that you can actually bale and use as feed. Uh, in other words, when you take down a couple of the objections that are choking out, kind of the moral hang-ups that are choking out the reception of the truth, then someone can really receive a lot in a short period of time. I think when you talk to people who've become Catholic, it's very often just a couple of objections they had, and once those were adequately answered, once they spent time looking for answers, everything else just kind of fell into place. And it shows us that faith is something we accept as a whole because it's a relationship, literally a relationship with the Son of God who elevates our minds with his very person, sent to us as the word of wisdom. Um, if you've been going to daily Mass, this is what we're, we're getting again and again from that first letter of John in the Christmas season. I think I should move on to number six. <laughs> we need to give people time. We need to give people time. We're not angels, so we can't process immediately. We're not computers. We can't process in a rapid amount of time. In fact, part of what it means to be human is to need time to think. We have to go from one image to another, from one way of saying things to another, from one way of understanding it to another, and go back and forth, sift through arguments, and to see their reasonability. You know, we might feel, when we talk to people about God, <coughs> and they give us a lot of opposition, we might feel we've lost. We're like, well, they weren't receptive. I don't know what to do. But in fact, very often we've given them a lot to think about, and that's good, and they just need time to chew on it. So it's not really for us to count our successes and failures. Maybe that's 6B. Six, six <laughs> leave it to God to count. Um, leave it to God to count success or failure. We need to give people time to change, time to consider. Number seven, we should encourage people to pray. Belief is actually a work of grace. You know, it's unfortunate when we think of the Christian faith as just a human reality. It's truly a human and divine one. We need God's, exist we need God's assistance. We need God's existence, too, in order to exist. We need God's assistance to believe the mysteries of the faith. He's revealed himself, but he also strengthens us through his grace. Um... You know, people will even recognize this to a certain extent when we introduce a mystery to them. You know, for example, the mystery of the Trinity or the Eucharist. They'll say, well, how am I supposed to believe that? I, I just don't have the faith. <coughs> and usually that's a really good sign. By the time someone's to that point, they're saying, well, I just, I just, especially when they're at a point where they're, I almost wish I did believe. You know, ah, that's a prayer. Turn that to God. That's a prayer. God, help me to believe, you know. Help me to believe. I wish I did believe. That's pretty much a prayer. When we, St. Catherine of Siena is always emphasizing desire as a kind of prayer. When we bring our holy desire to God, he fuels the flame, the fire of our holy desire. I wish I did believe. Uh, we should encourage people to pray. Um, there's so many stories of, of, of this being the turning point. You know, we as Catholics have the benefit of the sacraments, which we know strengthen us in faith, hope, and charity whenever we have recourse to them worthily. The sacraments strengthen us. But for those who aren't yet incorporated into the body of Christ, into the church, they need those little pushes from God outside of the sacraments. We call those operative graces because they help us to operate, to do something, those actual graces of conversion that can move the heart. And we can get those anytime and any place. So even those not yet incorporated into the church through baptism, 
even they, as they pray, can receive grace from God. Um, in fact, we know infallibly they will. Whoever prays for themselves, for their salvation, perseveringly and devoutly, will receive grace from God. Um, and so I think it's there that we really kind of turn someone to, to build and cultivate that relationship with God. Uh, oftentimes that's the, that's the big thing they need from us is, is well, you've, you've done your homework enough. What you need now is prayer, experience of God. The last tip from Aquinas, and this is, I think, a very important one. This was, I remember distinctly when I was first learned this in college by a professor who, who would tell us, well, don't be afraid to give people the whole picture. Don't think, oh, I can only talk about what someone has accepted so far. We're really going to be limited if we, if we restrict ourselves to what someone has received. We need to give people the whole picture. And frankly, a lot of people have big picture conversions. People who are especially drawn to the faith through beauty, I think, have big picture conversions. Here's what I mean. It's, you know, it's, it's like uh, if, you've ever, um, if you've ever read Brideshead Revisited, there's a, um, the main character, and I, you should read Brideshead Revisited. Let me just put that in there. Um, the main character, one of the main characters, says, well, how do you really believe all that, that Catholic nonsense, all those, all those fantastic things about the virgin birth and, and uh, about dying on the cross and rising again, all, all of those fantastical and beautiful things? And the character's response is, oh, I believe them because they're beautiful. <laughs> um, that's not where we would want to stay, but that's not a bad place to start, you know? I believe because I've been overwhelmed by the harmony of all the truths of the faith taken together. Frankly, people get this at some point, but for a lot of people, that's what gets them at the beginning, that, oh, there's an entire coherent picture of the universe and human nature and God available through the Catholic faith, available through sacred scripture and tradition. Many people will, will only really be open to the fullness of the truth when they see that there's a, a harmony of all the truths taken together. So we want to give people the whole picture, the whole story of creation and salvation and our part in it. That God exists and created the world and we sinned, so he became man and died for our sins and rose again. And now he's working on drawing us to himself. So by doing this, it's true that you'll be moving far beyond what can be known by reason alone. But I think when most people tell you about their conversion, it'll be something like this. Just a few pieces falling into place and the whole coming into focus. I realize God loved me or that Jesus died for my sins. I realize Jesus is God and he's truly present in the Eucharist. So to draw everything to a close, I think that these principles from St. Thomas, both the, the kind of basic philosophical principles, uh, the complicated philosophical principles maybe that are hard to grasp, but also these maybe practical way of saying it, these down-to-earth ways of saying these tips, they give us confidence so that we aren't so timid maybe the next time we have to talk to someone about the faith or the next time we have that desire welling up within us to share something of the faith we know and love. I think that could easily be another one added to it. Where do I begin when I want to talk to people about God? Begin with the things that you love. Um, begin showing them that, well, it's God who you love. Begin showing them the elements of the faith you depend on for your daily life, the elements of the faith you find consoling. Ultimately, that's what wins others. That's what wins others over through this experience that we have of seeing someone who's befriended us so that they can give us God who calls us to divine friendship. Thank you. So we usually have maybe a five-minute break, and um, then we have questions after that uh, for as long as, as long as you want to stick around. Um, while you're on break, I should get some pieces of paper, a couple of things, actually. Um, while we do our break, the, so I was a part of a project that produced a, 
a Dominican RCIA program, which is complete with a book and video, um, which we use for RCIA here now. But I just want to let you know, you all can have access to the videos through St. Patrick. You just need this, uh, this piece of paper can explain how to get that. Uh, you just need the code from St. Patrick's. And so you can, I only have like one piece of paper, so if you could just take a picture of it with your phone, that'll give you everything you need. It'd be a very millennial move. Um, <clears throat> it's a self photograph. Um, um, the other thing is, I, I think that the next talk will be about confession, and I especially want it to be about questions that people have about confession. So um, maybe on some extra handouts of mine, if you have particular questions about confession you would like to see treated, please write them down. Just take a whole piece of paper, write it down, and give it to me. Um, so I think that'll be our February talk. You know, anything you've ever wondered about confession. Uh, hoping to get another Dominican who's written a book on confession uh, to be the presenter. We'll see. Say a prayer. <laughs> so we'll be back in five minutes. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I have um, this microphone, which is just uh, because it adds to the video that will go on our, onto our website. It won't actually make your voice louder. Um, so it's more of like for posterity's sake. Thank you, Father. Your presentation was very, very worthwhile. Thank you for that and the time and effort you put into it. Father, just a, a question of the matter of gift. Is faith a gift? And if it is, what part of it is? And how does one, um, the word I want, how does one uh, merit mm -hmm. receiving the mm -hmm. gift in consideration of study and mm -hmm discussion with Catholics yeah. Yeah. and RCIA and that sort of yeah. thing. But eventually, I mean, I pray a lot in Thanksgiving for, I, mm -hmm. I think it's a gift. I don't know mm -hmm. how else I mm -hmm. got it except to be where I was and given mm -hmm. what it is. That's a great, that's a great question. Um, so you can hang on to the mic for the next person or have the next person can grab it. Uh, that's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, so the word grace is, just means gift. Um, if you think about it, and I'm glad that you turned to the word gift, because faith indeed is a gift. Anytime we're talking about something God gives us, um, God gives us as a grace, as a gift, um, it's, it's truly and fundamentally something he gives us, and it's, you know, something we don't deserve, and in a way we could never make ourselves worthy of deserving. That's just it, that not only our existence itself is a gift, but the grace that he gives us, especially those initial graces, are unmerited, you know. Now, you make a good point, which is, what can we do to increase our faith? Uh, and this is where we need um, actually a little bit of the theology of merit, which is itself very interesting, that, uh, and St. Thomas is a, is a kind of leader in explaining how this all works out, um, because there are things that we do in grace, you know, with God's grace already living and operating in me, I can then do further things to merit an increase in grace. So for us as Catholics, deserving and meriting are things we can only really do in Christ, in grace, you know. Um, so the non-believer who's struck over the head in a lightning bolt of conversion, did he deserve that? No. None of us does. We didn't deserve baptism when we received it. Uh, it was a gift. Uh, and in that, in that, especially when we think about infant baptism, um, a gift we were unaware of at the time, you know, but is actualized and uh, grows in us as we become conscious and have those first stirrings of our, of our own, um, you know, moral agency. Um, so that's a great point. That, you know, I think we see people do, what are, what are things I could do to increase my faith? As you mentioned, study, of course, study of the scriptures, um, and, uh, you know, study of the, of the doctrine of the church, you know, reading the catechism. There's, there's one for every level, right? You know, um, there's one, you can go as deep as you want. Um, you can go as uh, brief as you want, you know. But especially because spiritual things are the things we're the most forgetful of, they're the hardest to hold in our mind and the hardest to keep in our mind. 
it's important that we do have a continual continual kind of recovery of the faith and reference to faith. This is why the liturgy itself is a, is a continuous repetition of the most essential things, you know. Think of how the readings come up in a, in a cycle for the year, reading the scriptures. What is, what is really faith itself? Um, I think it's important to see the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who is himself the Word of of wisdom, the eternal word. He uh, dwells in our minds. You talk about the dwelling and indwelling of the Trinity. Faith is especially connected to the action of the Son, Christ, in our, in our minds, elevating our minds. The Spirit elevates our wills so we can hope and love. Um, but the Son, you know, our, our action of faith is what puts us in contact with the Son, which is, you know, precisely why it's so dangerous to be a cafeteria Catholic or a selective believer. Say, oh, well, I like these things over here, but not these things. Um, Well, faith is about a relationship, you know? And to say, well, I believe that some of the things God tells me are true, but some of the things, ah, no, I don't believe in. Well, you're undermining the very relationship as soon as you start picking away, chipping away at, uh, at what you believe in. You don't look satisfied, so. Oh, yeah. Oh, you are satisfied? Yeah, I feel okay. good about it. Uh, I, I don't want to oh. want to hold other people back from okay. asking questions, but I do have follow-ups, but I'll, I'll see you okay. another time and okay. I'll talk with you about them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I love the, the putting together of faith and grace. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love that. Thank you. Faith is a grace. But it's I mean, also gift grace, yeah, gift and grace. Oh, okay, I'm yeah, sorry. which which is yeah. it all works though. Yeah. Thank you for your uh, depth In, into uh, the deep. That's the whole point. Yeah. <laughs> We're going way down now. <laughs> here we are. Uh, here we are, somewhere way down there. Um, the uh, paradigm of um, of following through with uh, faith and reason as mm-hmm. follows. The paradigm is typically if a God who can create the universe in its expanse and its wonder and its power and its mm-hmm. just, you know, awesomeness, if you will, if that same God can, uh, can create uh, a fantastic world that we have now, mm-hmm. obviously, and that would be the argument, obviously he can also cause the... Um, uh, he can also cause the um, uh, the virgin birth. He can uh, walk on water. He can rise from the dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, he can do whatever he pleases f- mm-hmm. for one major reason. That's because he's God, mm-hmm. and he calls the shots. End yeah. of story. Okay. Now that is a paradigm, essentially, uh, uh, mm-hmm. you know, in, in, a, in a shortened form, essentially under which uh, Christians operate. Okay. Mm-hmm. Catholic, Protestant, whatever mm-hmm. else. That's the paradigm under which we mm-hmm, operate. Mm-hmm. However, when you kind of move away f- a little bit from that paradigm, the whole thing sort of falls apart. Uh, and I'm sure Aquinas could pull it back together somehow. But uh, for the life of me, unless there is, there is faith that there could be a virgin birth, that there could be mm-hmm. the rising from the dead, that could be the walking on mm-hmm, the water, mm-hmm. that could be the healing of uh, paralytics sure. and raising others from the dead, etc. All those things are in the Gospels. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I don't see where where reason comes into that mm-hmm. in a very clear way. Mm-hmm. Okay, that if and I was I was in a Jewish fraternity when I was in college, and you mentioned that a little while uh-huh. ago. Okay. You wouldn't have believed some of the some of the discussions. Well, you maybe you would have. That some of the discussions were like really way over the top, and mm-hmm. you know, and there were some Christians that defended the faith. Mm-hmm. Um, but I sat there going like, "What the heck's going on around me yeah. here?" It, it yeah. was just a really tough discussion. So let me rephrase your yeah. question just real yeah. short before I yeah. answer it. Um, I'm not even sure what the question was, but I think the question is that does reason fall apart once we get into the Gospels? reason fall apart um, I mean can you imagine a virgin birth all right can you imagine a rising from the dead well, can you is, imagine the miracles of loaves and fishes etc I think it's important actually reason. just to um, just to talk about just to use the right phrase you know so fall apart would I'd be a little uncomfortable with uh, the actions of Christ in the scriptures draw us above 
our mere human imaginings. You know, St. Paul talking about God gives immeasurably more than we ask for or imagine. Say it again. God gives us immeasurably more than we ask for or imagine. Okay. Whose power at work in us is able to do immeasurably more than we ask for or imagine. The incarnation itself, though the Old Testament predicted um, the suffering Messiah, though uh, the Jews were faithfully reading the scriptures, um, in, in some ways, uh, it's just something you, you can never believe until it happened, you know, <laughs> uh, that God would actually become man. Uh, it's beyond our wildest dreams. So it draws us above our mere human conceptions. Yes, the Gospels draw us above reason. Um, I think lurking in your question might have been like also this attitude, which is, um, correct me if I'm wrong, we need the big picture, and the big picture is going to require faith. So why should we bother with reason? Is that fair? Um, n no, okay. but I mean, in terms of the bigger, the big picture starts with God creating all of creation, mm -hmm, okay? mm -hmm. and the paradigm being that if He can do that, He can do anything He wants. So yeah. that, that I get, and, mm -hmm. and I can grasp that, and I mm -hmm. can accept that. Mm -hmm. However, when we, when we separate that if you will, the gospel of the Old Old Testament mm. from what happens in the gospel of the New Testament. Um, it, well, it's, but it's hard, I would say it's hard, it's hard to it's hard to link reason, you know, with with virgin birth, all that. Okay. The Old Testament itself gives us revelation that draws us beyond human reason. You know, I would I would say that too. That it's might truly be true. Revelation. That might be true. But it, it, I, I'm I'm trying to work work through how reason mm -hmm. justifies or is a, a, a gives us approval of of virgin birth and just from a scientific point of view. I think. Um, I think what you might be looking for here is actually another category. So a lot of what I was talking about, saying that God is one, that he exists, these things that we could know, in principle, we could know by reason alone. Those are called the preambles of the faith. Uh, I could talk about that a little bit. I didn't, it, it's a term that's sometimes more confusing than, than helpful. But anyway, there's another category of things, which are called motives of credibility. And these are the things that you might say, give us that signal that we're dealing with something than more than a human reality here. Um, for instance, you know, uh, the unity of the church, the, the indefectibility of the church, the miracles, um, the holiness of the saints, uh, the motives of the credibility you know, are, are what kind of warrant our surrender to God in faith, um, in part. Um, this is just it, that, you know, think, of, think about this puzzle, too. If, if people saw Jesus work miracles and still didn't believe, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that miracles are not of themselves the most important thing. You know, they're not of themselves sufficient to make everything run. We actually need an interior acceptance of God's grace through faith to lift us and believe. Um, that's really important because so many people say, oh, well, if only I saw with my own eyes this miracle. It's like, false. People see all the time and deny it. People meet the incorrupt part of John Vianney and deny it, you know, um, stuff like that. So, I'm sure between the two of us we can work towards a better answer, but maybe I should give someone else a chance um, to ask a question now. No question after that? Hmm? We are into the deep. <laughs> well, thanks for coming out. To, sorry, did you have one? I have one Go ahead. Might be a little bit off topic. I think one more would be, would be good, oh. would round us out. I think my question might be a little off topic, but at the same time, mm -hmm. it might bring it full circle. Mm -hmm. A lot of, in reading Aquinas' work, he heavily relies on Aristotle and Augustine. Mm -hmm. And when you look at that and look at how they were ahead of their time mm -hmm. and how everything drew back to the faith, and how Aquinas even built upon what they had taught, mm -hmm. how do we build upon that in ah, the 21st that's century? Question. That's a great question. Right, and there's obviously uh, ways in which Aquinas has been improved upon, you know, um, uh, or things he didn't quite get right, which have later become clarified, you know, uh, things which in his time were ambiguous, but have in a subsequent tradition, and even by statements of the church, have been clarified. That's an excellent point. 
I think the most significant thing in your question is just it points us forward that you know Aquinas isn't the end all be all. He's merely a trusted guide and teacher. Um, tremendous wealth of wisdom that he gives us in his writings, um, and you know, frankly, I think he would be very excited about, for instance, the scientific discoveries of our own day, and very um, open to integrating those with uh, the vision of reality. Uh, he, he, we already know he articulates. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good point. Um, uh, we should see him too as a source, among others, that we're moving forward with. You know. yeah. Well, thanks for coming out tonight. Let me go ahead and give you a blessing. O oh God, our Father, whose mercies are new every morning and who give immeasurably more than we ask for or imagine, pour out an abundance grace upon these, your sons and daughters, your servants. Increase faith, hope, and charity in their hearts and the gifts of the Holy Spirit through the intercession of St. Dominic, St. Thomas Aquinas, and all the saints. Lead them safely to everlasting life. May the peace and blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.